afternoon, everybody. Please let me welcome you very warmly to Sawgrave's Summer Seminar. I'm Nigel Bowles. I'm chairman of the Board of Trustees at Sawgrave, and it's our pleasure to offer these seminars once every term, this being the summer's edition. And today we have the distinct and special pleasure of welcoming to the Sawgrave Seminar Dr. Nina Yancey from New York. I had the privilege of watching Nina at her work and her scholarship in Oxford when I myself worked there, and of listening to her several remarkable presentations about her research. Nina completed her doctorate at Oxford where she was not just a Rhodes Scholar, but if I may say so, a quite extraordinary Rhodes Scholar, a remarkable intellectual power, uh, someone who made a great impact upon her peers uh, and upon, uh, upon the academic staff in Oxford in the departments of history and in political science. And Nina's coming to talk to us this afternoon about a subject on which she is expert, on which she has spent a great deal of time engaged in scholarly research and about which she has recently published a book with Oxford University Press entitled How the Colour Line Bends. Nina, it's a particular pleasure to have you with us this afternoon. Thanks so much for giving your time. We now look forward very much to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Nigel, so much for that very kind introduction. It is a real pleasure to, to be here. And, and so thanks to everyone for, for listening in for today's talk. I'll share my screen and start by recognizing that today's event is, is partly being held in honor of Juneteenth. As many of you may know, Juneteenth is a newly recognized national holiday um, in the United States celebrating the emancipation of enslaved people. And the history of Juneteenth comes from my own home state of Texas. It was in April, 1865, that Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union soldiers in Virginia, but not until June, June 19th, that Union troops reached Texas and that US General Granger read aloud the order that all enslaved people were free. The focus of my comments today and uh, the site of the key case study in my book is, is not Texas, it's another state, Louisiana, which is Texas's neighbor just to the east. It's not where I grew up, but where generations of my family on both sides come from. And on this occasion, I think it's worth starting by honoring the fact that Louisiana is the kind of state where it's hard to forget how recent the abolition of slavery is. Granger read that order aloud only 157 years ago. And you know, one very obvious example of this is the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, the largest prison in the United States. It sits on the site of the former Angola plantation, so named in the 1800s for where most of its enslaved people were from, um, and which became a prison farm in 1901 and continues to be farmed mostly by black men, now incarcerated men to this day. There's a much longer history to tell about Angola, stories like these, stories of slavery, and that's not the core focus of my research. Um, but again, on a day like today, I think it is worth remembering how much the history of slavery continues to shape contemporary racial politics uh, and how much racial politics can change over time while also looking the same, staying the same in other ways. And that's really what I'll be speaking about today sharing insights from my recent book, How the Color Line Bends. And I'll first share some key context and definitions so that we have a shared foundation going into our discussion. And then I'll spend a bit more time doing a deeper dive on that key case in Louisiana, which is the case of a city that hopes to call itself St. George. So to begin, I'll start with a feeling, which is the feeling of being invisible. Maybe some of you can relate to that feeling. It's one that has a particularly long lineage in the Black American experience. And that's embodied in a quote from Ralph Ellison, 
who says, I'm invisible, understand, because people refuse to see me. The word refuse is important here. I started with a feeling and a lot of conversations about race and particularly race in America right now focus on feelings. But importantly, my research is less about feelings than it is about power. And in my case, who has the power to decide what is seen and how? Who has the power to refuse to see? This is the point that Toni Morrison once made in a response she posed to Ellison, which was, invisible to whom? Not to me. What's implied in this comment is the basic point that when we talk about Black visibility, we are generally talking about how Black Americans appear in the gaze of white Americans. This is just one of many consequences of the Black-white color line, the term we use to refer to the social, political, and economic divide between Black and white Americans. Being on the white side of the color line tends to bring more power, including the power to decide what is seen and how. To define this term just a bit more specifically, here's the definition I use, which recognizes that the color line is part metaphor, metaphor for mechanisms and practices, things like beliefs, actions, behaviors, biases. But it's also a literal description of the divide between black and white Americans, referencing the places and systems in which black and white Americans fall on other sides of a visible or invisible line, whether we're talking about economic outcomes or, or physical spaces. My interest is in the relationship between these two things. Specifically, I call this the relationship between prejudice and place. These different manifestations of the color line, how they interact and reinforce each other. So as a research question, my, my statement is, what is the relationship between where white Americans live and what they think on issues related to race? The first part of this question gets at place, the different geographies of race and class that white people across the United States experience in their, in their local settings. This map just recognizing the diversity of racial landscapes we see in cities across America using 2020 census data and a different dot for uh, different racial groups, visualizing those different experiences. And then the second part of the question gets at prejudice. This is fundamentally a group identity and preference for one's own group over another. Um, and importantly, prejudice can include feelings directed toward an outgroup, whoever you might call them, but also towards one's own in-group, us. I measure prejudice both through public opinion surveys and also through qualitative interviews. And so then going back to the relationship between these two things, the two parts of this question, local geography, racial politics, I'm far from the first person to investigate this area. Much of the research I'm, I'm responding to descends from a landmark study of the 1940s American South, where a political scientist, Vio Key, saw that the larger the black population, the greater the support for the segregationist Southern Democrat Party at the time. And so from this finding was born something called the racial threat hypothesis. The idea being that as the size of a black minority population grew, so did the threat that black population posed to the white majority in terms of competition for economic resources, political power, et cetera thus leading to more racially hostile actions and attitudes among the white Americans in those settings. And now I should acknowledge that people often ask me the question, but wait, isn't exposure to diversity a good thing? Isn't that something that we want and that we fight for? And the answer is yes, but it depends. Exposure to diverse settings is wonderful when people um, are of equal status, have common goals, have institutional support to collaborate, this is one reason why diversity in school settings and university settings can be so valuable um, as a way to get to know and, and interact with 
um, people who are different from you. The challenge is that exposure to diverse settings can also exacerbate that kind of us versus them thinking when groups live near each other, but perhaps remain segregated and unequal. And so many decades after this landmark study from the 40s, we still see that more diverse settings or settings becoming more diverse can trigger racial hostility and protectiveness among majority groups um, in the United States context among white majorities. And so this is where I started. Um, when I started my, my master's research um, at Oxford and I was interested in this dynamic, uh, interested in, in place um, and prejudice, but then the question I started asking myself and the question that I ultimately ask in my book is one that draws on Toni Morrison's reply to Ralph Ellison, which is a threat to whom? Or from whose perspective does a black population represent a threat? The problem with not typically being honest about the answer to this question is twofold. On the one hand, we risk construing blackness as inherently threatening. Just one example of this is the well-established finding that white poverty is portrayed more sympathetically than black poverty in US media and political discourse, which is a trend that's been well-documented and dates back to the 1960s. On the other hand, it's important not to position white Americans as the victims of a racial threat or to just assume that the white American perspective is a neutral one or an American one, no modifier needed. An example of this is the title of a well-known political science book called Why Americans Hate Welfare. The book is actually about why white Americans tend to dislike welfare, by which we're referring to welfare spending um, or poverty assistance in the United States. Um, and they tend to dislike poverty assistance framed as welfare because of associations between the word welfare um, and stigmas around the supposedly undeserving black poor in the United States. A more recent example of this dynamic of kind of neutralizing white Americans, just American, is from the recent election of Virginia's current governor, um, this Wall Street Journal headline saying, you know, Youngkin makes the GOP the parents party. Notice no modifier needed in front of parents. Um, debates over teaching about race um, and anti-racism in public schools were critical um, to the debate leading up to the election and drove a lot of white parents in particular to support um, the, their choice of governor. Um, that of course not coming through um, when only parents are referred, not white parents in particular. And so coming back to this relationship between geography and politics then, my main intervention in this realm of racial threat scholarship is to be explicit about who in America typically has the power to decide what is seen and how. And so I, I recast white Americans from the victims of a racial threat, which is the character they're often implicitly positioned to play, to instead seeing them as viewers, active viewers of their surroundings through a shared racial lens. And what this means is that I recognize whiteness is not uniform. We see a huge diversity of white attitudes in America today, ranging from overtly racially hostile um, to incredibly racially progressive. At the same time, recognizing that shared white lens acknowledges that white Americans do view the world from a shared structural position, from a place atop America's racial hierarchy. And I, I will acknowledge too that any group's perspective will be subjected in some way, right? Anything will be shaped by the specifics of our position. The challenge though is with white Americans, that perspective and the position from which it comes is a dominant one in our racial hierarchy. So that means unlike other groups, their perspective isn't just subjective, but it's also um, a, power, a powerful one, a racially privileged one. Applying this logic to the study of racial threat of local geography means 
that I argue white Americans view their local world through this shared racial lens too. They see different landscapes of race and class in cities across the US. And they have some responsibility, some agency in drawing on what they see to inform their preferences. Whether they choose to feel threatened to see a black population as a threat or whether they choose to respond positively to diversity if they so choose. And so that's the focus of my book. I first um, in the book illustrate this shared white American perspective through a qualitative deep dive into one context. That's the one I'll tell you a bit more about in, in a few minutes. And then I go on to show how that white perspective operates in cities across the United States. Um, so beyond this setting in Louisiana through quantitative analysis, pairing public opinion data from Americans across the country with census data on where they live so I can look at their opinions in, in the context of their local surroundings. As I mentioned today, I'm gonna to focus on, on this first part um, and try to bring it to life. And so I have uh, just a bit more context to share with you about the case of St. George, Louisiana. And so now I invite you to join me in Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge is the capital of Louisiana. You see it here on this map with this drawing of the state capitol building. It happens to be, as I mentioned, where much of my family is from. Uh, my great grandparents were sharecroppers near Baton Rouge. Uh, my dad grew up there. Um, it's why I was familiar with the area when looking for, for case studies that I might be able to dive into to, to bring my research to life. But the real reason it's a focus of my book is because of what I found when I, when I started looking. Uh, which is the case of St. George. This is an effort by part of the Baton Rouge area to establish a new city in the Southeast part of East Baton Rouge Parish. Parish is the term for the county unit in the United, or in Louisiana rather. Um, and the point of establishing this new city um, was expressly to create a new school district and to sever ties with the current East Baton Rouge Parish school system. Organizers have been trying to achieve this in some shape or form for about 10 years now. Um, this photo is from the effort that was ultimately successful uh, at Billboard um, from the 2019 vote, where a slim majority of voters who lived within the proposed um, new city boundaries, the only ones who were allowed to vote on it, um, about 54% voted yes to creating the city of St. George. Although that was in October, 2019, the incorporation was soon after stalled in court um, for what ended up being over you know, two years. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, a Louisiana judge ruled that the creation of the city as currently proposed would be quote, unreasonable. I'll tell you a bit more why shortly. Um, but the important thing to take away for now is that um, organizers are already working to appeal the verdict. So the fight is sure to continue. Um, and this subject has ended up being more timely than I, I thought it might be when I, when I first started researching it many years ago. Why St. George was contentious and, and, and drew criticism was twofold. The first set of reasons relate to Baton Rouge's fraught history with school desegregation. So the Baton Rouge area is home to one of the longest running federal desegregation lawsuits in the United States. For 47 years, East Baton Rouge Parish schools were under a federal order to racially integrate um, schools um, and under federal oversight, um, meaning they had to get approval to make changes um, and the federal government had a say uh, in what was going on in the, in the local school system. Uh, the lawsuit was brought against East Baton Rouge schools because after the Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, uh, which um, outlawed the uh, racial segregation that had currently been you know, the law of the day in America's schools, um, East Baton Rouge did almost nothing. Um, and so you know, a couple of uh, years following the the Supreme Court case, this lawsuit was brought, um, but still for a couple of decades, 
East Baton Rouge made almost no progress. They took token efforts to integrate. Um, they had some voluntary programs where families could opt in, but, but very little happened. So in the early 1980s, a new judge is appointed to the case. And as of 1981, he implements a strict busing order. And so what this meant is that students in Baton Rouge were assigned to different schools than they might have been zoned to previously based on where they lived. Um, and they traveled to those schools across the parish on school buses in order to achieve a better racial balance across East Baton Rouge schools. So this strategy is called busing. It was being implemented in many places across the US and nowhere was it very popular. Uh, in Baton Rouge as elsewhere, um, white families in particular were very opposed to the strategy. You know, there's a separate story to be told about black families' experiences of this strategy, um, which also was not entirely positive. Um, but what happened is white families left the public school system in droves. As of the 80s, about 60% of students in East Baton Rouge Parish schools were white. Uh, today, only about 11% are white. That would fall even further if St. George succeeds, which I'll explain shortly. Um, in the process of, of this total uh, racial shift in, in schools, um, private schools are growing, Catholic schools are growing, white families are taking their children out of the public system or they're leaving the parish entirely. They're moving further afield um, to, to places outside of the Baton Rouge area. In the process, there's also a huge shift in the economic makeup of schools um, leading to a super majority low income population today, four and five qualifying for free or reduced lunch, which is an indication of, of students from a um, lower resource background who, who qualify for, for lunch in schools. This obviously um, presents a lot of challenges for the school system um, and wouldn't be called successful integration per se, um, but by the time the lawsuit finally comes to an end in the early 2000s, um, officially in 2003, but some federal oversight remained until 2007, just to give you an idea how recent this is, um, as soon as federal oversight is lifted, in quick succession, three parts of the East Baton Rouge Parish school system break away and form their own independent school districts, trying to wipe their hands clean of this connection to this, this long battle over desegregation of, of schools. Um, and this provides direct inspiration for St. George. It's uh, you know the direct descendant of this legacy of, of fighting over uh, integration in schools. And again, of that tendency um, that's emerged since the end of the lawsuit to break away from the much beleaguered system and form independent districts in kind of smaller parts within East Baton Rouge Parish. Then as for um, the other reason St. George was contentious, even putting this history aside, uh, is because of demographics today. So first it would be a large city uh, for Louisiana at least, um, 86,000 people would make it the fifth largest city in the state, um, right next to the state capital, of course. Um, it is only about 12% black in a parish that is almost half black. Um, and as you can see in these per pupil funding numbers, funding would be projected to increase to support students in the um, new St. George School District um, and would uh, decrease in the East Baton Rouge Parish School District. That's not even accounting for all of the um, tax dollars that would flow from uh, that currently flow to the, the, the city of Baton Rouge um, by default um, that would then go to the city of St. George. So the incorporation of St. George would represent a, a very significant loss of funding for both Baton Rouge's schools um, and for its, its city parish government. These maps illustrate what I just described. On the left is a, a map that uses dots to show the concentration of, of families of different um, races. The orange dots um, in the top uh, represent a part of Baton Rouge called North Baton Rouge. That's a very concentrated black community. And then you see a much greater presence of um, white families, um, the blue dots in the southeastern part of the parish. And then on the right, you can see that that overlaps with where the proposed city of St. George uh, would be created. This map being from that 2019 effort that was successful. 
a final bit of context is that I did my research in Baton Rouge. I spent time um, talking to people about St. George in the summer of 2016. This happened to be during a waiting period between a failed first and then the successful second effort to um, bring St. George to a vote. But that timing matters because I happened to arrive in Baton Rouge shortly after the killing of a black man, Alton Sterling by local police, and just before a sniper attack that killed three law enforcement officers. Um, and so the, it ended up being a time where conversations about race and policing and, and violence were um, very much activated and, and contentious, totally again by chance. And then just to, to recap then, race is relevant on any given day in Baton Rouge in light of its uh, demographics. Layered on top of that, the fight over St. George brought a lot of opinions to the forefront and made it a rich place in which to speak with people. Uh, and then finally, this period of racialized violence in 2016 made race even more top of mind for residents. So it ended up being a tragic time to be there, but also a perfect storm of sorts, a, a theoretically rich time to be conducting research. And so now the scene is set. Uh, I spent that summer talking to 48 residents of the larger Baton Rouge area, 36 white residents, 12 black residents. Um, and in conversation with Nigel, I'm going to tell you a bit more about what I found there. And to transition, I'm going to read a bit of my book from you, um, just, a, just a few minutes. Um, but I thought before we jump in, it would be nice for you to hear my interviewees in their own words. So I'll, I'll read now just a short segment from the start of chapter three, the chapter of my book in which I, I really dive into Baton Rouge and, and the stories that I found there. Uh, and I'll introduce you to two folks named Randy and Deborah. I was surprised not to have gotten a flat out rejection sooner. Now listen here, I've been around a long time, said the voice on the phone. I grimaced. I hadn't been told to listen here since I was a teenager. The term does not usually preface good news. Why would someone come all the way from Oxford to ask about St. George if not to try to expose it as some sort of racist effort? This chilly response came from a St. George supporter and colorful persona named Randy. His reply exposed how central race had become to the conversation around St. George. Supporters were actively on the defense to demonstrate was not racially motivated. It's a testament to how small a mid-sized city can feel that less than a week later, I found myself squeezed into a 12 year old sized desk next to none other than Randy himself. We were both attending a school board event at a local middle school. He had arrived shortly after the meeting started and the only open seat was right next to me. Randy, of course, had no idea that I was the researcher who had come all the way from Oxford, where I was a graduate student at the time. Both of us blended into the mix of attendees at the meeting. Older white graduates and younger black ones of the same nearby high school, whose racial demographics had flipped drastically in the mid 1980s during the de desegregation lawsuit and the busing order. Um, but for which the group was organizing a multi-decade alumni event. Randy's persona in this setting was opposite from what I had experienced in our tense first exchange. He was congenial and inclusive, emerged as a natural leader in the biracial group and clearly was respected by the others for his commitment to the school. I introduced myself to him once the meeting ended. Having spent the last hour sharing a copy of both the meeting agenda and the Louisiana State University and Southern University football schedules, lest the group accidentally schedule a future event that clashed with a football game. Randy was probably more inclined to believe that I had some legitimate interest in the Baton Rouge community than he had been on the phone at least. Afterward, we ended up sitting down to talk for an hour and a half. Although an outspoken supporter of the St. George effort, Randy not only lives outside the boundaries of the proposed new city, but is one of few white holdouts in North Baton Rouge. He still lives in the historically white blue collar neighborhood where he grew up and has experienced its changing demographics firsthand. 
Randy slightly overestimated the black majority within the city lines, but he maintained black white doesn't play into it to me very much. My encounter with Deborah cut off to a very different start. In response to my first question, which was simply to tell me about the area, she took a deep breath. Let me just tell you some of my background because I don't wanna throw your data off, Deborah said. She is a social worker and told me that a lot of social workers literally choose the nice area by zip code. Deborah explained that she, on the other hand, would work anywhere in the parish where her services were needed. I've been in lots of parts of Baton Rouge that most people, middle income people, probably never have been, she said. Underneath Deborah's words are racialized meanings. Nice and middle income being code for predominantly white areas and a predominantly white income bracket. But, was, but what Deborah was trying to communicate to me was clear. Unlike many white middle income residents of the parish, Deborah was intimately familiar with the social ills plaguing North Baton Rouge. And as an active member of a community organization called Together Baton Rouge, she had vehemently opposed the St. George effort and volunteered time to campaign against it. Deborah was realistic about the severity of racial inequality in Baton Rouge, but she spoke with pride about how much that group, Together Baton Rouge, has brought black and white residents together. The race crap is gone, she said with elation, in reference to the community group's gatherings. That is not an issue. As opposed to other settings around town where the topic of race might be avoided, she said, at Together Baton Rouge, we're comfortable. We've used those words enough with each other. We can talk about it. On the surface, Randy and Deborah look like polar opposites. Randy is proudly conservative, a bold supporter of St. George, and adamant that race is of little significance in Baton Rouge. Deborah falls at the other end of the spectrum in both her politics and her stance on St. George. And she believes that racial inequality is a major issue in the parish, yet, the conclusions Randy and Deborah reach have something in common. Whether race doesn't play into it or the race crap is gone, both reveal an understanding of race relations in which racial group interests are largely irrelevant to shape in one's perspective, priorities, or motivations. Even as Deborah believes that race is a powerful structural force shaping life outcomes in East Baton Rouge, she argues that racial categories can be superseded when it comes to sharing stories and perspectives. The rest of this chapter explores such instances when similar logic underlies the speech of white residents of Baton Rouge, despite the range of political opinions they express, ultimately revealing a shared perspective descending from white Americans' place atop our racial hierarchy. And with that, I'll end and Looking forward to joining Nigel in conversation. Nina, thank you so much. You've given us a great deal to think about and to reflect upon and to discuss. I should just say for the for our audience online that um, you and I had agreed that we'll now have our own discussion for a quarter of an hour or so, and then throw it open to Q&A from the audience, if that's OK. Um, Oh, that's remarkable testimony, uh, Nina. It's just extraordinary, and if I may say so, very moving too. Um, I wonder if I can just, as it were, nudge the conversation about those interviews you did with Randy and Deborah, which are, uh, as it were, layered and complex in ways that perhaps they did not first um, seem to, to be, but in, as you've explained, really are. Um, and I wonder if you could say what you think the wider implications of their testimony, and indeed the testimony of your other interviewees is. That's a different way of framing that question is to ask, how did interviewing that those, those people for your doctorate change your understanding of the structure of mm -hmm. 
racial politics? And it's, it's a great question because interviewing these folks totally changed my perspective and ended up being critical to, to the argument that I, I made in my uh, doctorate and that goes on to inform my book. Um, and so I guess, you know, from the start, as I said, the case of St. George was an ideal topic for me. It was a contentious issue where race and geography were both implicated and it was on people's minds, offered a really good opportunity to join people in, in conversation to ask about it. Uh, but I had planned to go to Baton Rouge originally, primarily looking for folks like Randy for St. George supporters. Um, and I, you know, I was, had been interested in this racial threat dynamic and, and was curious to speak with um, white Americans who were supporting causes or taking actions that might be consistent with, with what we have called uh, feeling threatened, uh, you know, desire to, to separate, to create new boundaries, um, to, you know, to have a, a school system more distant from an overwhelmingly black and low income population. In that process, I talked to white opponents of St. George, I talked to white observers of the effort, and I also spoke to black residents, primarily to get a better sense of the history of the area to make sure I was understanding the full story for context. And it was in that process that I was somewhat surprised by the similarities that started to emerge out of my conversations with very different people. Um, and, and, and that was what was on display in Randy and Deborah. I started to notice the ways that the speech of the white respondents, even as they disagreed with each other, was structured by similar themes and logic. And so the reflection was that what they said was different, but what they were doing was similar. The underlying logic of their arguments was similar. And so throughout that, the chapter that follows that segment, I highlight this sort of similar underlying logic. I talk about kind of four key themes. Um, and I argue that this is evidence um, of that shared white perspective. This is one way of understanding how racial identity can shape white Americans viewpoint even as they express very different individual views. And it was in recognizing the similarity in that finding from Baton Rouge um, that I ended up really rooting a lot of my argument in something called standpoint theory and the logic of positionality. The core premise of positionality is, is maybe what it sounds like, which is that your structural position affects your viewpoint, right? Where I stand affects what I see. And there are very deep roots of, of this idea is manifested in what's called standpoint theory and feminist scholarship. And as a simple example, if you wanna understand misogyny, speak to someone who identifies as a woman. And if you wanna understand capitalism, make sure you're talking to someone who's a worker. Um, the idea is that people who are marginalized in a given system, a given hierarchy can often best tell you how that system works. This is theorizing from the bottom. In Baton Rouge and in my analysis of what I found there, I flip the script and I ask about what the people at the top don't see, what is not visible from the perspective of someone who's, who's powerful, who, who doesn't have to worry about navigating that system because they sit atop it. Um, and so I, I, I came back and, and again, looking at these similarities, started engaging more with this literature and, and building out um, this argument about how, um, the racial identity of, of my respondents of white Americans in general plays a role in what, what they do see, what they, what they don't see, what they choose to see, right? How they choose to interpret the world. Um, and so, so it ended up being that experience of Baton Rouge, the kind of surprising similarities between people like Randy and Deborah that really informed my argument about this shared white perspective um, that, I, that then motivated me to revisit my quantitative work on the relationship between uh, local geography and racial prejudice um, to revisit that work um, with an argument about this shared subjective white view of the world, even as white Americans express different views, um, which ultimately you know, became this overarching argument about how the color line bends, about the flexibility of prejudice, the flexibility of a white perspective that can stretch across even buried white Americans' attitudes. Thank you, Nina, for that. That's extremely interesting. I, I found myself, as I was reading your book, which I was this week with, to my great profit, um, asking myself sort of two questions, one major question, the major question being, 
What was it like for you as um, a black woman interviewing white people in this state and in that place at this time in the context of an America which has undergone some pretty painful, not to say terrible uh, racial experiences, racialized experiences over the course of the last several years, not least those of, those of George Floyd and all that flowed from it. Um, what was it like for you to interview those, those, those white people? Now you've given us a partial answer to that in, in the case of Randy, where your, your story was, <laughs> I thought your story was going to start off, it started off and I thought, ah, oh, this is going to be a, a recognisable story. Then it became more nuanced and complicated, which is <laughs> fascinating in itself. Um, so I wonder if you could say something about that experience. I should say the subsidiary question was, I was also wondering what, as it were, the ghost of V.O. Key, who wrote that great book, Southern mm -hmm. Politics in 1949, might have thought had he been sitting in that meeting too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, first on the experience itself, probably an important bit of context is that doing this work in 2016 was inevitably different than had I done it more recently. And um, I think the ways that things have continued to polarize, uh, the behaviors that have been kind of unleashed, um, seen as acceptable, have changed. And so I, I've actually asked myself several times uh, in the last few months uh, around the books, publication, you know, what would it be like to replicate some of this work um, today? Um, and I, I think it probably would be similar, but, but potentially just with some more extremities. Um, but so to, to what it was like in 2016, it's also worth recognizing that there's a long tradition of Black Americans observing white Americans with a critical eye, with an ethnographic gaze. Um, the idea being you have to understand how white Americans work as a key survival skill you know, for your own protection. Um, it's a tradition that dates back to the days of slavery. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very much as a, as a black person commenting on white people in America, following a very long tradition, um, but it is rare to see this kind of work in, in political science. It was definitely something I've realized was a more notable feature of my research design um, to the extent that uh, a handful of white American professors uh, expressed skepticism and were um, a bit wary of my plan. Um, and the, the main reasons for that wariness were they were worried that people wouldn't talk to me uh, and they were worried that people wouldn't tell me the so-called truth, that they would only say what I wanted to hear. And the reasons I decided to go Forward regardless, I think also kind of bring to life what the actual nature of my experience was. Um, first, on people not talking to me, it is worth clarifying that I was asking about St. George, right, about this issue that everybody had heard of locally. Um, I was also talking to people on the heels of these racialized shootings, so I wasn't asking anyone to reveal their deep secrets or asking them, tell me what you think about Black Americans, but asking about, you know, popular issues. It's also worth noting that a huge legacy of the South is the ability to maintain social, emotional, political distance from Black people despite close proximity. That is a key inheritance of Jim Crow. And so, um, you know, the, the extent to which I could coexist quite comfortably with Randy is an exact descendant of that, of that history, um, you know, knowing how to interact um, with with someone in, in close proximity um, while still maintaining a racial barrier. Then on the kind of concerns that people wouldn't tell me the so-called truth, um, here I was skeptical of this assumption that there is you know, neutrality or honesty or purity in what white Americans would say to one another uh, as if that space isn't also a performance. Um, you know, It's um, just as true that a white interviewer's race would have shaped what the respondent said as, as, as that my race obviously did. Um, and, and here was, is where I, I think I actually ended up encountering some benefits um, of my race, which is that I obviously racialized the interview setting that people I'm sure felt more inclined to comment on race when I was there asking the questions. Um, but in many ways that was, that was useful. I mean, there were sometimes uncomfortable comments made, uh, you know, about, you know, people like you um, kind of, implications around the black middle class. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, 
negative stereotypes invoked. Um, but but that itself was information that was interesting. It's you know it's not irrelevant to understand how a white American would present to a black person. Um, and I think kind of the final benefit is that I talk in the book about the fact that I occupied the space um, that Patricia Hill Collins would call um, being an outsider within. Mm -hmm. She uses that term specifically to refer um, to black women in academia, uh, which I, I certainly was uh, at the time. Um, but but the, the definition she gives is um, an outsider within is someone caught between groups of unequal power. Um, and so I was not just a black woman in academia, both kind of in the academy, but having marginalized identities within it. I also was an outsider within in Baton Rouge. Um, and so I was an insider in that I, I have deep family connections there. I could explain why I was there, right? I could interact easily with people like Randy because I grew up interacting with people like Randy. I could um, engage in, in the norms of Southerness. Um, I also had, you know, the legitimacy of, of someone coming from a, a known university. I was the person asking the questions, right? But then on the other hand, I was obviously an outsider. I was a stranger from out of town at that time coming from quite far away. Um, I was, you know, young, I was a woman, I was not, you know, threatening in, in other senses. And sometimes elements of being a stranger can make people more willing to share than they would if they were talking to someone they could see at church the next Sunday. Um, and so I think I, it, it, it ended up being an experience that was, um, I, mean, I mean, fascinating, sometimes, you know, tricky and uncomfortable things would come up. But to be honest, not that different from my life as a black person growing up in the South, spending time in Louisiana. Um, and so the the challenge uh, was much greater to convince, I found, um, to, to convince pr primarily, I would say like the white academy uh, that this was a, a, a valid approach that there was um, merit in doing this. Um, that was really the bigger hill I had to, to climb um, if I think about what was difficult as opposed to having conversations in this setting. Again, just because of, um, I think the, the skills and inheritances on both my side and my um, interviewee side. Um, and then I think finally to your, to your question about you know, key, it's an interesting one and I'm, I'm probably gonna think about it a bit more, but to be honest, I, I think, I, I imagine he wouldn't be too surprised by how the um, the interviews went down, and and I also think, and I try to recognize this in um, the book itself, that um, he himself, I think, recognizes the power dynamics that I try to bring Absolutely. to yeah. in my in my book, and I and I actually think that it was as his original finding was interpreted over um, a long period of time, and I think particularly the kind of um, 80s, 90s period is when we start seeing language that feels really devoid of power um, and it feels like it's really, you know, guilty of assuming that there is an actual threat when, you know, I think the O'Key in his work, he points out that the Black residents of those counties um, where the support for the, the Southern Democrats was greatest among white voters, those Black residents are the ones who are actually the most threatened in terms of, you um, their own safety, their own well-being. Um, and I think his work that brought corpus of work really highlights that point and, and deeply engages with power dynamics. And so um, in, in my work, I, I, I want to recognize that and honor that. So I think he would, I, I imagine, and I hope, I guess, maybe would be, um, you know, of a similar, of a similar mind as, as I, um, whether thinking about the actual conversations I had or about the argument of the book more broadly. Well, for what it's worth, Nina, I, I think that too. I mean, and Vio's <laughs> book is absolutely classically about a geography of power um, uh, and political power. I, I, I entirely agree. Um, I'm, there are a number of threads to pick out from there. Now, you've you've mentioned the that you've mentioned uh, middle class and the views that some of your interviewees might have had about a middle class professional academic black woman asking these questions. You also discuss in your book what you call the threat of the black middle class, I mean, in particular, the threat of the black middle class. Um, I want you, to, if you would, to explain how you define middle class in this context, because it's often used in a rather looser sense in everyday conversation, certainly by many, not all, but by many journalists. I want to know what you, how you define it, and then to say something, if you would please, about 
what you understand by the nature of the threat of the black middle mm -hmm. class that mm -hmm. that some at least some if not many whites perceive yeah I, I love the question about defining the black middle class because it is it is one worth asking and um i i think one response to that that i've appreciated in the literature is um i believe this is mary patillo who argues that we should really say the non-poor uh non-poor americans um because the truth is that um, there is such a burden of poverty still yeah. among Black Americans today that when we say Black middle class, often we're just talking about people who are in a position where they're not, um, you know, critically struggling for for resources. Um, if we just want to be be tr truthful about what the lived experience would be like, um, there's then a, a obviously a larger debate to be had about income versus wealth. And as listeners may may know, a, you know, real challenge is that even as we see closure in um, disparities in income between black and white Americans, the wealth gap is just, you know, cavernous and has grown. Um, so there, there's so much to say there. I think the um, way that I really engage with it in terms of my research um, is thinking less about specific definitions of who falls into which category and more about the premise of, um, of relative status, of relative standing of Black Americans versus white Americans. Um, and so I particularly look at um, this, you know, so-called threat of the Black middle class in terms of perceptions among white Americans of a rising Black middle class, the idea that Black people are getting richer, broadly construed, and that white people are getting poorer. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll tell you a bit more specifically, and hopefully that brings it to life. Um, and this is very much an example, and I'm using the word threat, I'm trying to be a, a little bit provocative, but um, an example of revisiting the relationship between prejudice and place and asking, well, what changes if we are explicit about the fact that white Americans have a subjective racial lens through which they view the world, right? It's not just that there is a threat in their surroundings, it's that they see a threat. And so um, in uh, this chapter of my book, chapter five, I look at um, white opinion in US metros, um, looking at a sample that was surveyed in 2006, 2008, and 2010. Um, and so this is a panel that spans the Great Recession. And what I find is that perceptions of a rising black middle class, specifically the idea that black people are getting richer as people respond on a survey, um, while white people are getting poorer, I find that that perception of a narrowing gap exacerbates opposition to affirmative action among white people. Um, and so specifically, this idea that black people are getting richer, white people are getting poorer, that gap is smaller, leads to greater opposition to a policy area explicitly meant to advance black status, right? That's explicitly meant to close that gap. Um, and so in some ways you could say, oh, that's logical. There's less need for affirmative action. I'm looking particularly at affirmative action in employment um, in, this, in this study. Um, you can say, oh, there's less need for that if you think that the gap in terms of just our who's rich and poor is, is closing between black and white Americans. Um, but there are two reasons that the subjective nature of threat is really important to remember here um, and, and why what I found in Baton Rouge ends up being relevant to this, this very different quantitative study. Um, the first is that I show the subjectivity of uh, someone's surround, experience of their surroundings um, by showing that it was in places where unemployment rose the most or the fastest, either way you look at it, that white Americans were likely to perceive that narrowing gap. So is this experience of economic insecurity during a recession, and of course, against the backdrop of Obama's election, given that this spans 2006, 2010, it's that experience of insecurity that the interpretation is in zero sum thinking, right? You know, my group is hurting, another group must be benefiting. We have a black president. Um, you know, we can, you can think about different ways to kind of bring that to life, make it tangible, but but what it what I see is a strong relationship between rising unemployment and this idea, oh, black people are getting richer, white people are getting poorer. Um, and, and then that belief goes on to predict opposition to affirmative action. And so, you know, first we see subjectivity at play because it's that perception of a rising black middle class that leads to more affirmative action opposition. But then the second key thing, and again, thinking about those similarities between Randy and Deborah, is that I find that this effect holds across the spectrum of white racial attitudes. So despite controlling for 
whether somebody has racially hostile or racially liberal uh, feelings towards Black Americans, also whether someone is a Democrat or Republican, this perception of a narrowing gap has its own independent effect on the life that someone opposes affirmative action. Um, and so, so I call this the threat of the Black middle class, um, partly to, to make this point that threat is subjective. What, what is one thing that's interesting about this, this part of my research is that a lot of scholarship on the Black middle class, which is understudied, it's, I mean, it's a nascent group to where we start this conversation, but a, a lot of the assumptions are that middle class, middle income, upper income Black people will be perceived more positively by white Americans, right? That it's just the association between Blackness and poverty or Blackness and violence or Blackness and other stigmas. That's the reason why we have problems. You know, it's all, um, it's all about just kind of improving Black people's economic circumstances. And of course, I deeply believe in the imperative to economically empower more Black Americans. Um, but this work shows that, you know, it's also possible that the Black middle class can be seen as threatening by white people across this, the spectrum. Again, if we're just thinking about the instinct to protect one's own privilege and power, um, the instinct to at least feel some defensiveness if you feel that a group that you've historically had, uh, you know, a more privileged position then is catching up. Um, and so again, this idea that the Black middle class, broadly speaking, you know, Black people who are getting richer defined really in terms of perception rather than actual um, income in my in my focus, um, that too can be construed um, as threatening, as a reminder to not just equate blackness with threatening and remember that it is it is through um, the, the lens of um, white American shared racial identity that that becomes uh, a source of threat. Very interesting, Nina, it's very stimulating. Um, I'm just wondering, <laughs> you're probably not going to appreciate this question. <laughs> I was going to suggest that you take on another project. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what if you were to if you were to decide. Let me say if you were to decide. If you were to decide that you wanted to do a similar study, but in a different part of the United States, let's say Philadelphia or Boston, yeah. Both cities of which, of course, have experienced extraordinary difficulties in racial politics. Uh, in the structuring of white power and in, in, indeed in educational politics and busing over the course of the last half century and more. Um, I wonder, and I apologize for throwing this at you, but I'm just wondering what your first thoughts are. I wonder what your working hypotheses might be about the differences you might find or the similarities you might encounter if instead of studying Baton Rouge, you were to study mm -hmm. similar questions in Philly or in Boston. Mm -hmm. What do you I mean, I, right. <laughs> right, any other place. No, it, it is a good question. I think um, I would no doubt take a different approach. And I think, um, it, you know, inevitably the research would be shaped by the specifics of that place, by the specific kind of ways of interacting. And I wouldn't, so I wouldn't want to presume that, you know, the way that I was able to naturally exist in a place like Louisiana would have been the same. Um, and so would, would certainly want to defer to those who do have connections to those places, what I would see it as, you know, a big uh, journey in terms of learning and, and kind of being ready to engage in terms of those kind of simple kind of cultural norms, but also in terms of understanding the history of those places, right? The history of the desegregation lawsuit in Baton Rouge, you know, still looms really large in the ways people think about schools, what's fair, what's unfair, who deserves what. And so I think, um, you know, my approach to diving into another city would definitely um, want to engage with their specific histories. Um, I think depending on the city, it would also probably require some real thinking about, um, you know, how different racial groups define themselves. I mean, just to recognize New York where I now live, you know, a hugely complex racial landscape. And I de definitely recognize that my book focuses on the black white color line in a way that does not capture the full spectrum of diversity in America today. And I think there are reasons that that's a valid approach, a valuable approach, um, but I think in a place that's not so evenly divided between black and white, um, you know, Baton Rouge was very much, uh, you know, looking at one of the most extreme uh, settings or a place where, you know, what I was studying was so evident, I think it would require, a, I mean, it could definitely still be possible, but I think I would probably want to be thoughtful and, and just recognize that the immigrant communities who identify as Black in, in New York City, um, 
would bring kind of um, its own complexity and story. So that would that would be interesting. Um, for all those caveats, though, about recognizing the complexity of, of each different setting, I mean, my strong hypothesis would be that we would find similar dynamics in terms of the, the workings of whiteness, the ways that um, racial identity does structure what someone tends to care about, tends to know about, tends to believe is their problem, tends to see as, as a problem in the first place. Um, so I would have a strong hypothesis that we would see some similar trends. I think the question would be in some of these cities, how have the last few years maybe shaped um, some people's awareness of where they might be blind, to what extent in some cities that probably had larger white populations who engaged in, in some reflection and activism after the murder of George Floyd, maybe there would be a little bit more um, awareness or willingness to reflect on what, um, what the limits of a white perspective are. Um, because the truth about Randy and Deborah is like, I don't think they would see themselves the way that I, I saw them, right? I don't think they would be aware of those similarities. Uh, it was really, I feel like me as an outsider or also just talking to the black residents I met in Baton Rouge that really highlighted those similarities. And I think um, I would expect to see, to see that, that shared um, whiteness of perspective, you know, that I would expect to see in other settings um, and would just want to be thoughtful about how to how to go about bringing it to life and, and thinking about well then what other questions could we ask um, in light of those different contexts that could that could move conversation forward in this area yeah, it's really very absorbing um, so a question that you know which just just occurs to me and hadn't occurred to me before it should have done is whether in the light of what you've just said about uh, Randy and Deborah not perhaps mm -hmm. seeing themselves as you saw them I'm wondering whether you've shared your findings and argument with any of your interviewees. You got a great what, question. What those conversations or experiences <laughs> were. Yeah, yeah. So I one thing I did earlier this year in advance of the book coming out was um, to contact all of my interviewees in Baton Rouge. So I got in touch with everyone that I was um, able able to, um, and um, had. A really fantastic time just on the phone with people in Louisiana. Not sure what experience anyone might have with uh, with folks across the American South, but in the process, I was you know invited to come in for photo ops or grab drinks with people or you know it was just I mean the and that's one thing I love about the South is that that true warmth and hospitality. Um, so the point of that though is that I, I did spend all this time talking with folks and um, you know I told them all about the the work um and you know invited them to to learn more or to read it i don't know how many actually did in those conversations i think what i had suspected was confirmed which is that some of the folks who were most uh involved in activism probably have done a little bit more to reflect on their own perspective in the last couple of years um it was clear that some of the ones who had been most supportive of St. George have probably moved towards slightly more extreme views as we've seen across the US. Um, but I don't know if any have yet read the book itself and what they might think. Um, and so, I mean, I'll definitely stay in touch and see see if any any have. Several told me they ordered it. So so maybe their, their feedback is yet to come. Um, and, and I'd be very curious to hear it. Um, but I also think, you know, uh, in the process of sharing this work with others, um, with my my peers, my colleagues, um, I think whether it's Randy or Deborah themselves, or people who could be Randys or Debras, who are maybe seeing or, or reading for one of the the first times about how they might be perceived by um, a black viewer, um, thinking about their own whiteness in another way. Um, I hope that that is valuable in terms of the uh, the new reflections that might spark, whether among people in the academy or or elsewhere, as we just become a little bit more about the, the limits of our own perspectives and think about the questions we, we should be asking, what we don't know, um, what we can't claim to know, um, and kind of you know, going forward with uh, humility about, about what we see and don't see. Yeah, well, on, on that note um, of the virtue of humility and what we see and don't see, um, Nina, thank you so very much indeed. And to those who are in on this, uh, occasion today who've been listening to you and observing you um, those of you who haven't yet 
uh, ordered a copy of Nina's book, I would strongly encourage you to do so. And those of you who uh, have ordered it but not yet read it, I would say there's a weekend coming up, there's a book to be read, <laughs> there's Juneteenth to be celebrated, and I think Juneteenth could not be marked better but by your wonderful contribution to our understanding of our subject that was and remains absolutely central to understanding of America. You know, thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Nigel. Wonderful session. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.